Okay, uh, so I'm, I'm very happy to be here in Mexico and among many people, representatives from Latin America. Thank you, Miriam and LATAM Startups, for the invitation. And uh, I just want to uh, quickly just talk about myself and the whole reason why I decided to come to Mexico City. Uh, as you heard, I'm the CEO of PiCap. PiCap is a venture capital and corporate finance firm located in Toronto, Ontario. And um, so I'm interested in, in looking for potential investment opportunities, but I'm also interested in forming partnerships because companies that we look to invest in are portfolio companies. And as a VC, uh, it's important to help our companies grow in forming partnerships with organizations like Startup Mexico or Angel Ventures or Startup Chile, Startup Brazil, that will allow us to have our portfolio companies get exposure to different markets within Latin America. And given that I'm Canadian, and my firm is located in Canada, as many of you know, Canada's market and our population is quite small. There's only about 30 million people. So it's critical for Canadian tech companies to expand outside of our, our home country. Uh, not only am I the CEO of PiCat, but I'm also on the investment committee of a number of different Ontario government-backed funds. And they too have their own going global program and asked me before coming here if I could help them connect with organizations that can help Canadian companies expand throughout Latin America. So that was my mission coming down here. But now that I'm here and I'm seeing all of the excitement and all of the progress and all of the potential, what I'm going to be doing when I get back to Canada is telling my partners and the managers of this Ontario government fund is that we should consider strongly investing within tech companies within this region and potentially helping them expand through Canada and the rest of North America as well. So today, my presentation is about venture capital funds. I find that uh, the VC world is very niche. It's considered to be very, very much an old boys network where a lot of people are aware of VC funds, but unless you're actually working within one, you don't really know that much in terms of how we look at investment opportunities and how we manage our portfolio. And this, of course, is important for entrepreneurs. And unfortunately, entrepreneurs, from what I hear, are stuck in traffic. But this is, all, this is also important for all of you. How many uh, VCs do we have in the room? OK, so I'm the only venture capitalist in the room. Many of the tech companies that you're going to be helping out with are going to need equity financing in order to get the capital they need to grow and scale and do all of those wonderful things that, that uh, all of the people from Startup Chile and Startup Mexico and Startup Brazil are talking about. Because these companies need to finance their business so that they could pay to uh, expand their sales, uh, perform research and development, et cetera, et cetera. And if they've created a product, it could be an amazing product, but if the world doesn't know about it, they're not going to be able to sell it. And oftentimes these companies are at such an early stage in creating products that have never been seen before, and thus these companies have no track record, then it's very difficult, if not impossible, for them to get financing from any other source. Banks will not lend them money. Uh, angel investors oftentimes prefer to invest in companies that they're more familiar with. Uh, and it's very difficult to access those angel investors unless they're somehow within your network. And so that is why for all of us here who are helping out early stage tech companies, it's important to understand what VCs think and what we do and how we invest in companies so you can help educate all of the tech companies that you're working with to help them get funded. And as I mentioned, this is a presentation about venture capital. 
Uh, I call it VC 101 for uh, startup tech entrepreneurs, but it really could apply to investors who are looking to get into the field and want to know what to look for, or people such as yourselves who want to support tech companies and help them grow. So uh, through my uh, journey throughout Mexico, I've noticed, as I mentioned, very few people know how venture capitalists invest. And in Canada and the US, of course, uh, being funded by a VC is all of the rage. We call it the holy grail, or the entrepreneurs do anyways. Because they feel that if they could just get funded by a VC, that will be the answer to all of their problems. But when I came to Mexico and I started to talk to entrepreneurs, aside from the very sophisticated ones, I found that a lot of aspiring entrepreneurs didn't even know what a VC is or what a venture capitalist is or what we do or, or how uh, we support companies. So I feel that this, this presentation is, is quite critical. So I'll just give you a broad definition. Uh, a venture capital fund is an investment fund that manages money from investors seeking private equity stakes in startup and small and medium-sized enterprises with strong growth potential. Investments are high risk, high return opportunities. And this is going to be a theme that I'm going to be revisiting throughout the presentation. So how do venture capitalists differ from angel investors? Well, angel investors invest their own money. So that allows them to have a huge amount of flexibility. It's their money, they can do whatever they want with it. Some angel investors will want to invest in VC typical companies. Others will be happy putting money into restaurants, manufacturing companies, or other types of products that can be manufactured, etc that don't necessarily fit the niche that a VC invests in. The important thing to keep in mind here is that VCs are portfolio managers. We manage other people's money. And in doing so, as many of you know, the finance industry is very, very highly regulated. So what that means essentially is that when you're managing somebody else's money, you have to be very specific upfront with what you're going to be doing with their capital. You have a fiduciary duty to your investors to make sure that their money is going into only VC investable companies. I was speaking with an entrepreneur a few days ago from the States who said that entrepreneurs generally hate venture capitalists. In Canada, I've heard the term blood-sucking vampires before to describe VCs. But the, <laughs> but the thing is, is that VCs have feelings too. We have a heart. <laughs> okay, so this goes back to managing other people's money. We have to be very specific. And when I have all of these companies presenting to me in Canada or China or wherever, and they have a great business, um, and they're passionate about what they're doing, and they can tell that I'm interested in what they're doing, and I, I feel for them. And then when they find out that I'm not able to invest in their company, they get upset and they think, you know, it's, it's something personal or something like that. But that's just not the case. VC, it's not like we're government money giving grants. We have to invest in very specific projects. And VCs, uh, one, one little extra thing that differs from angel investors among venture capitalists is that venture capitalists, once again, because we're managing other people's money, we're all about return. It is critical for us to only invest in companies where we can achieve the highest return possible, given the high level of risk involved in investing in early stage tech businesses. Whereas angels, they might invest in something because it's a hobby or an interest or they want to become a part of the team, they like the entrepreneur, etc. Okay, so when you're talking to entrepreneurs and they're gearing up to pitch to a venture capitalist, 
this is this is the most important part. They have to understand what VCs want and what VCs need in order to put money into their company. And this will also help them understand if their company is VC fundable or not. So a, an exercise that I like to give entrepreneurs when I'm mentoring them is to say that look at your VC investor as a customer and look at your equity that you're selling him or her as the product. So what does a VC want? A VC wants a unique idea, something that's disruptive, some sort of technology that has never been created before. It's better if this is on a global perspective, but if it's regional as well, meaning that if it's a tech company that is exploring a new region and could potentially be similar to another tech company, it's still new to that region. Alibaba in China is a great example. Some early investors would think, oh, it's too close to Amazon. Likewise with Tencent in China, they would say, oh, that's too close to Facebook and WhatsApp. But both of those companies are unicorn companies because they harness their ability to take over their home territories. Another thing that we want is um, barriers to entry. So what I mean by that is that it's difficult for new competitors or new entrants into the market that you're selling into to be able to copy your product or come up with something similar. One thing that uh, is very popular for tech companies to look at in terms of barriers to entry is getting patents on your intellectual property. But other things could be uh, applicable as well. Maybe you have great connections, inroads into your target market. Like if you're selling to Walmart or you're selling to uh, McDonald's or some huge corporation and you worked there previously at an executive position, you know the buyers, that could be a potential barrier to entry as well because new entrants won't have the accessibility that you do to your distribution channels. Another thing, of course, we want is market traction. Sometimes this is difficult for early stage tech companies because you're early stage, you're brand new. The best form of traction is revenue, of course, because people are paying real dollars to the item that you're producing. And once again, this can be challenging for an early stage tech company because you need VC funding in order to bring your product to market. So if you don't have revenue and you're not able to get revenue, you have to think of other ways to prove that you have market traction. This could be any number of sources, and especially if you're a tech company, this should be easy to do. Maybe you have pilot projects with your main buyers. Maybe you have um, a huge amount of users using the freemium portion of your product. Another great um, indicator of market traction that I always tell entrepreneurs that are pitching me and they tell me that they're in talks with Google or they're in talks with Amazon or Canadian Tire or whatever the big buyer is, I, I would say to them, okay, well, that's great to be in talks with them, but if you think that they're serious about buying your product, just get a simple LOI, letter of intent, non-legally binding document that just says on paper, I so-and-so from XYZ Incorporated am interested potentially in purchasing this product provided they do this, 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 and this. Once again, it just goes back to market traction. We're also looking for the perfect team. Sometimes there's a trend, or at least what I've seen in Canada and some other countries that I've visited, for engineers to create an amazing technology and product in the basement of their parents' home or something like that. And, um, and then they, they want to come to market or they want to get funded by a VC to bring their product to market. And it's just them doing it on their own. And then when, as an investor, we start talking to them a little bit more in terms of their market strategy, uh, in terms of their, their budget, their financials, etc., we discover that he's a brilliant engineer, but 
lacking in so many other different ways. And so it's important for entrepreneurs to understand that nobody is perfect, nobody can know everything all the time. So you got to be bringing people onto your team that could compensate for that. Typically it would be a uh, CTO, engineer, techie meets an MBA or investment banker type. Okay, what does a venture capitalist need? So in order to generate those high returns to compensate the high level of risk, we look to generate 10 times the money we put into a company within a four year period. We call it a 10x return. We put $100,000 into your company, of course you want to get million back within a four year period. How do we get this money back? I was actually just talking to an entrepreneur from Peru about an hour ago who said to me, Stuart, I just want you to know that our company, it's not like we're in love with our baby and we want to bring it to IPO or we're, we're going to grow it as fast as possible and we want to go of it. And you're going to be along this journey with us for many years. He's saying we just we created something amazing and we want to sell it. That's what VCs like to hear, having an exit strategy, selling it to a corporation that will buy it for strategic purposes. Other acquisition or exit opportunities for venture capitalists is um, through an investment by a later stage VC or a private equity firm, an IPO or initial public offering. That's when a company wants to go public and issue their shares on an open exchange like the New York Stock Exchange or the Toronto Stock Exchange. Or the founders of the company, if the company itself is generating enough revenue and income, they could consider buying their equity back from their original VC investors. So as mentioned, okay, so Finance 101. If you're going to be putting your money into an investment that's very risky, you have to demand at least the potential for a high level of return. Otherwise, there's no reason why you would put your money into something risky when you can invest into a mutual fund or a GIC or, or a treasury bill, for example. So keep in mind, high risk, high return. Not only do VCs look at companies in terms of is the return potential high enough to compensate for the high risk of the company we're investing into, but also, is the return potential big enough to compensate the high risk of all of the other companies in our portfolio? There's a common model that VCs look at. We call it the two, two, and six. So what that is is basically uh, two companies out of 10, we would expect and hope, will become extremely successful, provided we all the right steps to make a venture capital investment. Other, another two companies we expect to see will go bankrupt or fail immediately. And then the other, then there's the six left over, which we call zombie companies. And these are companies that are described as ones that never die, yet never fully live. They're just kind of treading water, sucking resources from the VCs, uh, keeping our hopes up that if we just put more money into it, more effort, more focus, one day they're going to reach that critical mass where they have the exponential growth. Those are actually the worst. So we have to have two companies out of 10 compensate the failings of the other eight, essentially. Okay, so just like to take a poll. Given what I've discussed, would you think that a good business will equal a good VC investment hands. Okay, so the truth is, is that it's, that's not necessarily true. As I mentioned, okay, so we get our returns predominantly from strategic acquisitions of large corporations who will buy out portfolio companies from us. And if you look at a good business, if you define a business as being good as one that generates revenue, that may not necessarily be a good VC investment. It could be a zombie company. The company is generating revenue, it's covering its costs, but it's never going to get so valuable that the VCs will be able to exit that investment 
at such a high return that that'll compensate all of the other companies in our portfolio that we expect to not perform. And this is also something that I, I, I this point right here is actually the whole reason why I originally created this presentation is because there was, I, I, I noticed a trend of these entrepreneurs in Canada, like I mentioned earlier, they're super passionate about what they're doing. They have a great business. They're pitching me and they could see I'm excited and then all of a sudden I say, I'm, not, I'm sorry, I can't invest. And you're, if I can be completely blunt, you're not going to get VC investments anywhere so you shouldn't try. But you have a very good business. Keep doing what you're doing. Just try to bootstrap or grow your revenue or get funding in a different way when the time's right, like through a bank or something like that. Like manufacturing companies, restaurants, et cetera, et cetera, they could have a nice steady growth rate and they can make the entrepreneurs happy and wealthy and secure, but they're not necessarily a good VC investment. Okay, so on a similar note, does bad business equal a bad VC investment? Hands. <laughs> okay, the same answer applies here. It's not necessarily true. And the reason for this is because, once again, if you define a good business as one that generates revenue, has stable growth, keeps the shareholders happy, it's not necessarily a good VC investment, but also a company that doesn't do those things isn't exactly a bad VC investment. And I like to use the example of uh, Instagram, although it's a little bit outdated now, but I'll use it anyways. Instagram was generating zero earnings before it was acquired by Facebook for $1 billion. Company that's generating zero earnings, zero revenue, is that really a good business? Probably not. Would it have been a good VC investment? Absolutely. Because there was a specific technology within it that was attractive to Mark's that allowed him to embed that technology into his corporation and then add value and follow a number of different strategies that he wanted to with that technology. So just a brief, quick summary. VCs will want to hear that the companies have exponential growth potential. So Keep, keep this list in mind when companies are coming to you and they're saying, could you help me get VC funding? Because a lot of these, a lot of companies, they, you, I've noticed anyways, that in terms of getting funded, it's, I, I see kind of a tail wagging the dog type scenario where they're asking me questions like, how will I structure my business in such a way to get a VC putting money in? Or they'll ask me questions like, I'm considering outsourcing to India but I'm worried that a VC might think that is a bad thing and that we should be performing and creating our technology in-house. And they're asking me for advice. And I, the advice I always give to entrepreneurs, and this goes back to, I think it was the startup Chile guy who said, entrepreneurs are the rock stars. They're the main guys who are running the show and creating value. VCs are just pushing paper around, putting money in different things, trying to help and add value. But um, it's the entrepreneurs who have to make the decision. And sometimes, like I said, it could be a good business that doesn't need to get VC funding. So they shouldn't be creating a company to get VC funding. They should be creating a company to make an amazing, successful company. And if it requires VC funding, go for the VC funding. And when they do, so when you're talking to these entrepreneurs, and they're telling you that they want to get funded by a VC, think about this list when you're having a discussion with them. Does the company have an exponential growth potential? Can a VC get a 10x return within a four year period from this company? Is it gonna grow 10 times its original size within a four year period? Do they have exit strategies? Do they have competitors or suppliers or some other vertical whereby a large corporation will want to buy them out for strategic purposes. Do they have traction? Can they prove that the market they're selling into actually wants to buy the stuff that they're producing? 
And are there barriers to entry? Does, does the company have patents? Do they have some other sort of unfair advantage that would allow them to become, become successful where new entrants will have a very difficult time? And um, because VC is so new, or at least it seems new from my perspective in Mexico, this slide may not apply right now, but it definitely will one day with the companies that you're mentoring. A lot of them get very worked up. They watch shows like Shark Tank or Dragon's Den, and they think, oh no, I'm going to have a uh, Kevin O'Leary type ripping my company apart in front of the world, and all I want to do is just get financed. A way to mitigate that apprehension it's just really understand what motivates a VC. Just like I've been presenting this whole time. Why do we invest in companies? What do we need? What do we want? Etc. Is your company a good fit? And remember, if your company is not a good VC investment, it doesn't mean it's a bad business. Look at other ways to get financed. The best way to get financed is by the cash flow that you're generating through revenue. Second best way is actually through debt. And the most expensive way to get finance is actually selling the equity in your business to someone like a VC. Just something to keep in mind.